everyone. My name is Mary Texera, and I am a past professor of sociology uh, at Cal State San Bernardino. Um, and uh, we have this wonderful program that we're very, very proud of that uh, we uh, want to continue today. And we have two guests that we think that you'll really, really love in terms of uh, a critical eye on law enforcement. Um, and this, these are special guests. Well, one is a very special guest because he is returning. We love when our students return and he's returning as not a student anymore. He's, he has his doctorate and uh, I can't wait for you to, um, to meet him. And so with that, uh, I will turn, turn the program over to Robbie Madrigal who will um, introduce himself and uh, do our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Mary. Uh, my name is Robbie Madrigal I'm from the Fowl Library and also would like to extend a welcome to our special guest today. Um, I'll go ahead and read the land acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since its <clears throat> founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Amber Bro Broaden. Peace, everyone. My name is Amber Broaden. I serve as an adjunct faculty in the psychology department at both uh, CSU Dominguez Hills and San Bernardino with a specialization in legal and forensic psychology. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Michael German. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike German. I'm a fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice and formerly served as an FBI special agent. It's my pleasure to introduce our guests. Daniel Gascon is an assistant associate professor at the sociology department at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, a research fellow at the Mauricio Gaston Institute for Latino Community Development and Public Policy. He's the founding director of the Racial Justice Laboratory. Daniel's current research combines sociology, criminal justice, law, and history. His recent solo authored work appears in the journals Critical Sociology and Social Justice, and he is the lead author of the March 2024 book, Police and State Crime in the Americas, Southern and Postcolonial Perspectives with the Paul Grave Macmillan Publishing. L.J. Fryerman is an alum from the University of, Boston, University of Massachusetts Boston Sociology Department and the Bunker Hill Community College Liberal Arts Department. They are currently a lab assistant at the Racial Justice Laboratory. Daniela and, and LG, welcome to the program. Uh, really interested in hearing what you have to say. You're, you're on mute, Daniel. Thanks everyone for this great invitation. Um, it's, it's such an honor to be back uh, at my alma mater speaking. You, know, you don't know how, how much it means to me to be able to, to be here and, and share my work, uh, our work. Um, this is a great time for all of you to be uh, reviewing this work because we are at the stage where we're still kind of going back and forth with the journal. And uh, we would really love the, any feedback that you all have um, to make, you know, maybe make this uh, work more impactful or clearer. Um, in any case, we, we're really uh, excited to show you what we've got. So let me start us off here. second, I'm sorry. Okay. So this work is uh, based in Boston uh, before Michael Cox. Uh, as I said, we are currently in the process of, uh, we have an R&R &R with the journal, the Du Bois Review, and uh, we're hoping to turn that into uh, an accept very soon. We actually just turn, turned in our second version and we're hoping to hear back uh, on that. I wanted to start us off with this uh, figure Michael Cox, who in 2022 was appointed uh, a police commissioner after having himself suffered civil rights at the hands of the Boston Police Department while working as an, an officer. What happened in 1995 
uh, was he was in a hot pursuit for a robbery suspect working in a plainclothes gang unit at the time when uh, four of his uniformed colleagues found him and caught up with him uh, and mistook him for a plainclothes officer and then uh, beat him severely uh, about the head and um, about the head and hands and he suffered a, a concussion, uh, a number of injuries and and when officers at the at the scene discovered that he was uh, himself also a fellow officer, um, they fled the scene, and that set off a long chain of events where officers uh, basically prevented the truth from coming to light for a very long period. Um, because of the department's foot dragging over over that long period, eventually Michael Cox, within six months. Uh, filed a suit against the city and, and eventually won. It took several years, but he won a million dollar settlement against the city. And in the initial suit, he claimed that the department fails to investigate allegations of misconduct by police, fails to properly supervise their officers and train their officers, and, and that they are especially uh, engaged in misconduct against black male suspects and other powerless citizens, as he described them. Uh, since taking over in 2022, he takes over a department that is, still has a number of the same problems of brutality, corruption, and racism. You take, for instance, the fact that since the 1970s, the department has been sued over 10 times for its problematic uh, employment discrimination policies. Um, not only that, but in, in, 19, in 2019, the ACLU of Massachusetts also sued the department over its uh, uh, violation of the First Amendment by, by way of usage uh, of its surveillance policies and its gang database um, management system. More recently, the Office of Police Accountability Transparency using the department's own records show that they disproportionately encounter and stop and arrest young Black and Latino men in specific neighborhoods of the city, such as Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. Now, why are we conducting this research in, in Boston? Um, well, first off, Boston is a very notable city, at least in uh, historical and criminological terms. Um, many times historians think of the Boston as the cradle of liberty. I mean, this is the, the beginning of the abolitionist movement. Um, it's, it's also, in terms of law enforcement, the birthplace of the first professional police force you know, born on modern liberal principles. Uh, by the late 20th century, Criminologists were regarding Boston and its police department as a miracle for uh, achieving significant reductions in violent crime uh, at a time when nationally rates of violence were skyrocketing. But the reality is that the city of Boston is deeply, deeply segregated and that historically its police have violated the law despite both of their longstanding liberal and progressive reputations. The city of Boston, for instance, has rates of inequality um, that, that are significantly high. For instance, if you, you, you take uh, nearly every, in every, nearly every domain of life, and, we'll, and LG will expand on this a little further, but nearly in every domain of life, uh, black inequality is felt very, very deeply. Not only that, but uh, if you take a look, for example, at the, at the badge on the right, at the police department uh, has this uh, number at the very bottom etched 1854 to denote the year of its founding. Uh, however, it's this belies its involvement in the in enacting the 1850 uh, fugitive slave law, in which and that's the flyer that you see right behind the badge there, in, in which the officers uh, in Boston were the very first uh, police department in the nation to enact this law, and it would, which essentially brought slave patrols to the north, a, a tradition in law enforcement that we should, you know, more often tr attribute to the South. And what we hope to accomplish with this case study is to reckon with this under-examined history. I mean, there are, if you're watching HBO or if you're watching Netflix, there's a number of documentaries sort of revealing the history of racial tensions in Boston since the 80s and 90s, and that's really the, the, the kind of conversation we're hoping to have more broadly. And so we, we hope to challenge this uh, idea that the city is just a liberal bastion. And these are, are our central research questions. How does the Cox beating fit within this larger context surrounding uh, Black freedom, the Black freedom struggle in Boston, uh, specifically against police civil rights violations? How does the incident highlight Boston's history of racial inequality and segregation? And what does Boston's history tell us about policing and civil rights organizing in the United States? 
And with that, I'll turn it over to LG. Thank you, Professor Gascon. Thank you guys for um, having us today. I'm LG. Um, policing the police in general refers to popular demands for police accountability, transparency, and reform. However, it's also a lingering civil rights battle. Leading figures from MLK to Malcolm X to the Black Panther Party spoke on these issues, reflecting many of the same concerns that Black Lives Matter activists highlight today. Since at least the 1930s, we have found that there have been sustained public calls for improved measures to police the police throughout the United States. The crimes that police most often need to be held accountable for are referred to as crimes committed under the color of law. It's a crime for law enforcement officers to deprive any person of their federally protected rights or impose differential punishments based on race. Section 242 of the Federal Criminal Code imposes criminal penalties on any person who acts under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, who willfully subjects any person to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the U.S., or to different punishments, pains, or penalties on account of such person being an alien or by reason of his color or race than are prescribed for the punishment of citizens. Um, the U.S. v. Crookshanks decision is influential in defining police civil rights violations for the court because of the precedent that it set that reduced congressional power to hold individuals liable for civil rights violations. This case involved the federal prosecution of William Crookshank and eight other KKK members for the killing of 100 Black citizens in Colfax uh, during what is now called the Colfax Massacre. In this decision, the Supreme Court said that prosecutors must prove the defendant's specific intent to discriminate against another person in order to activate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment in cases involving collective racial violence. Since then, the federal government has treated police involvement in racially motivated civil rights violations as a patently local crime, which gives local authorities full responsibility to investigate and litigate these crimes. However, um, the historic record shows they rarely do either. The Black Boomerang is where all of the cases that uh, we detail in this study took place. Throughout the 20th century, in migrating Black populations from various regions of the diaspora have been largely confined due to both de facto segregation and systemic inequality to the Black Boomerang, which is this little boomerang-shaped strip in Boston comprised of the neighborhoods Mission Hill, Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan. In the late 40s, Michael Cox's parents moved to Boston, becoming a part of the larger Great Migration of Blacks out of the South from the early to mid 20th century. And um, by the year 1960, Boston's neighborhoods were deeply segregated by race with a disproportionate distribution of whites in the suburbs and blacks in the city center. For instance, Roxbury, which was previously integrated with blacks and white Jews saw the Jewish people move with white flight into the suburbs during the 1950s. Michael Cox was born in 1965 at the height of Boston's civil rights movement. This was only two months after the NAACP branch won its lawsuit against the city for its segregated and underserved public school system, leading to court-mandated busing about a decade later, and also two months after MLK led a march from the Carter Playground in Roxbury to the Boston Common downtown. Far beyond housing and schooling, however, Black Bostonians now and historically have endured inequalities in nearly every domain of life. For instance, employment discrimination in Boston saw the don't buy where you can't work campaign. Um, and there has been, and it still is a staggering wealth gap between blacks and Latinos and whites in Boston. Since Cox was born, crime has become an increasingly salient problem in the black boomerang. The late 60s and early 70s saw a rise in drug-related crime that would last for the next decade plus. By the late 1980s, Boston had a serious problem with drug-selling gangs and territorial violence, especially amongst youth under the age 24. Um, and so now we'll move into the uh, cases that we're looking at in the study in Boston's movement to police the police. 
So excessive police force was a central concern amongst many groups and figures during the early years of civil rights organizing. One case served to catalyze Boston's larger movement. On um, July 8th, 1934, George Borden, a black janitor from Roxbury, was eating dinner with his wife and young children when a uh, city motor vehicle inspector Everett Gardner and police patrolman William Harmon appeared at his door armed but in civilian clothing. They uh, served Borden an arrest warrant for an outstanding parking violation. Borden, who had previous negative experiences being arrested for minor crimes, attempted to flee the scene and this led to a police case that ended with Gardner shooting Borden. Uh, Borden would die about a week later from gunshot wounds. Uh, after the shooting, Boston's legal actors uh, moved quickly to absolve the law enforcement officials. The two officers gave false testimony at the trial. They said that Borden threatened them with a revolver. This contrasted with Borden's bedside testimony, which never entered the court record in which he denied ever owning a gun. Uh, Gardner was acquitted by Judge Albert Hayden on all charges. But uh, civil rights groups were determined to hold Gardner accountable, and they demanded justice for Borden's death and retribution against Gardner, Harmon, and the RMV. A funeral that doubled as a public demonstration was held for Borden by the League of Struggle for Negro Rights and the International Labor Defense. On October 30th, uh, Borden's family brought charges against Gardner, uh, who was issued an arrest warrant but let go on a $1,000 bond. However, the RMV did suspend him, and two years later, Borden's widow was awarded $1,000 by the city. While several, while civil rights groups may not have succeeded in securing a conviction in their case, they did galvanize the city civil rights movement for years to come. Um, in 1949, Muriel and Otto Snowman, two black, Snowden, um, two black social workers, uh, formed the Freedom House in Roxbury. This was a center for uh, black civil rights organizing and they hosted social educational events. Um, archival evidence shows that the Freedom House became a focal point of black civil rights organizing and throughout its early years, police protection or lack thereof was a central concern. Over the next decade and a half, organizers in New York were becoming increasingly aware of the deeply rooted culture of brutality amongst urban police. In a 1948 speech, Dan Dodson, director of the New York Unity Committee, argued that officers lack sufficient training in the field. Um, within five years, Freedom House organizers began pointing to similar conditions of differential treatment and brutality amongst urban police. Um, and proposing police reform measures. Specifically, Muriel Snowden uh, wanted to diversify the Boston police force by adding more black officers. And she thought that this would mitigate the differential treatment that they were fighting against. Um, jump to about a decade later, the so-called Roxbury riot occurred during a period of widespread urban rebellions around the country and provoked local organizers to embrace black power, cultural nationalism and militant strategies to combat excessive force. Uh, this took place on June 2nd, 1967, Mothers for Adequate Welfare or MA staged a protest at the Grove Hall Welfare Office. They locked themselves inside the building with employees using bike chains and um, police wearing full riot gear and wielding Billy clubs broke through the crowd and entered the building. The crowd began throwing projectiles at the police um, and eventually this erupted into a full-scale riot which resulted in injuries, arrests, and property damage. Archival footage shows that in the days after the riots, mall leaders spoke to the press to clarify the group's intentions. Doris Bland, the founder of Ma, appeared on TV and read the demands aloud. Uh, to cut off checks on hearsay or malicious gossip, to remove police officers from the welfare office, for caseworkers to be present at the office every day, for social workers to stop verbally abusing their clients, um, and most importantly, for welfare commissioner Daniel Cronin to be dismissed and replaced by someone chosen and approved of by Ma. 
Um, the Ma organizers and city leaders had opposing views on what sparked the riots, while the Ma organizers saw their form of protest as peaceful, uh, the police perceived it as aggressive and in response became violent. Mayor John Collins had several responses, plans, and hoped that they would help keep the peace. He wanted to appoint a fact-finding committee to further investigate the disturbances. He wanted to hold public hearings with Cronin, Ma, and other interested parties to discuss improving the welfare system. And he placed uh, Black clergymen and lawyers inside three Roxbury police stations and an officer within Operation Exodus, which was a Black parent-led school desegregation initiative in Roxbury. Um, all of this was to ensure instant communication. It's unclear how long these lines of communication remained open or how long these placements lasted, but it is clear that police further saturated Roxbury over the next year. This increased police presence led to more explosive conflicts, tensions, and escalations in violence, which was a nationwide issue. Organizers and young people held protests during this period to bring attention to the systemic abuses they were enduring. The simmering tensions were a sign that Black organizers and young people in Roxbury were becoming increasingly militant and legalistic in response to systemic racism. Uh, many civil rights organizations formed throughout the city, and a key turning point was a speech from Stokely Carmichael, Prime Minister of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Um, Carmichael, in his speech, observed the infighting amongst Black organizations and urged them to put their differences aside and form a united front. Days later, the leaders of dozens of Black organizations met and agreed to form the Boston Black United Front, which was a militant activist and legalistic coalition. Their primary goal was to hold police officers accountable for the shootings of unarmed black men. Uh, the organizations that comprised the front included the Black Panther Party and the NAACP uh, and many others. Uh, it was led by local activists, including Chuck Turner and Leonard Durant, and it organized four major actions from 1970 to 72 in response to police shootings. Um, one of these key instances was a community trial for Walter Duggan in the case of Walter Duggan uh, versus black people. More than 700 people attended as a community led jury found Walter Duggan guilty for the murder of Franklin Lynch and he was sentenced to a public shaming. Uh, this is called poster day and you can see on the slide here, a poster featuring Duggan's name, address, uh, picture, and charges was posted all over the city of Boston. And back to you. Thank you. By the late 20th century, uh, police were a mainstay in the Black community on, all throughout the Black boomerang. Um, saturations were, were really a response to the increasing rate of crime at that time. Um, while in the past you had seen civil rights groups involved and, and activists and organizing in the community, um, Black activist clergy took a much more prominent role in, in the late 80s into the 90s. And part of this had, was, was a way, part of this was done in response to the crime uh, epidemic that was going on at the time, but also there was a need to kind of inspire public unity, public trust, not only in the public, the police department, but the government itself all of whom were, were struggling not only with this mounting rate of crime, but also struggling with a crisis of legitimacy at that time. <clears throat> Part of the challenge you had, or one of the probably one of the more significant cases that we've seen, uh, we saw at that time was the false arrest of Willie Bennett. Um, this was a response to the murder of Carol Stewart, who we later learned uh, was, was actually killed by her husband, uh, who killed her for the insurance money. Um, he falsely accused a, a, black, a random black man uh, for committing the crime and police without much of an investigation into the, the veracity of his statements uh, descended upon uh, the Mission Hill projects and for the next 90 days uh, con conducted a mass stop and frisk operation. They stopped about 150 people per day. Um, and, in, in the, and, and in some of the worst instances, they actually sexually assaulted the young men. 
Um, the young man complained both to the ACLU, uh, to the department itself, and to city officials that police officers would pull their pants down in, in full public view, um, and 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 and, and um, you know they would just become uh, be involved in very invasive searches. Um, under increasing pressure from this, uh, as a result of this incident, um, the, the city mayor at the time organized the St. Clair Commission to try and bring about some recommendations for change. Um, but that, that was, those recommendations really ne never came to pass. When they were publicized, uh, it was recommended that the department uh, do away with the police commissioner and that they reorganize the department to, to better suit the needs of the community. But none, none of that went very far. Immediately after <clears throat> the recommendations were made public, the city mayor disbanded the group. Um, none of, the, of those folks who were uh, harmed as a result of the mass stop and frisk operation, either Willie Bennett or the M Mission Hill residents, ever saw justice for the abuses they've suffered. They brought a civil suit against the city, but were unsuccessful uh, in, in that suit. Afterward, um, Black ministers were among the loudest critics, including Reverend Grayland Scotland Hager of the Community United Church, who likened both the role, both the actions of the city mayor and the police department to the KKK. Um, however, these historically high rates of crime and serious violence really provoked Black ministers to band together. There was one instance in particular in which there was a gang fight um, in a church during a memorial service for someone who had been killed in a drive-by shooting. And it was really that kind of instant, that, uh, that moment that helped to crystallize these men to speak out against crime and to work with police and other city agencies to reduce uh, crime. So, that, so these ministers kind of really helped to mobilize their own congregations, other churches, the police department, you know, they started holding clergy patrols to go out and proselytize to people in the community. Um, they use they use these as occasions to bring people into uh, church initiatives and, and to try and reduce crime. They started to uh, work with with probation officers and share information. Um, and 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 over time, it really had a significant impact on the rate of crime that we saw in the city. Another caveat here is that the the ministers also went out in front of the police department to really speak on, uh, on behalf of them to the Black community and to try and cool tensions when they did arise and also speak to the, to the professionalism of the department. So they, they were really responsible for help, helping to cool public sentiment, even in cases of police abuse, because it was seen as a lesser of the two evils. Youth violence was so significant at the time uh, that, that it was seen as a lesser of the two evils. So what do we what do we learn at the time is that while these black ministers uh, were shielding the department under their umbrella, this was at the same historic moment in 1995 when Cox's case was unfolding. Right when you see the improper investigations, when you see misconduct both on the part of officers um, throughout the rank and file, but also in the leadership um, of the department. Federal, the federal court didn't intervene in many of these cases or didn't necessarily find a reason to side with uh, with, with plaintiffs, but they did in, the, in Cox's case. And there might be a lot of reasons for that, um, especially given the amount of evidence there was in his case, maybe in contrast to some of these others, um, but his was definitely different in that respect. Um, their court decision is not the only historical break we should consider. There's a, not, a lot of other continuities uh, in this story as well. In particular, the increasing criminalization of, of, of Black youth through, over the course of the 20th century. So it, well, it, whereas initially it was the figure of the Black man that became criminalized, toward the mid-century, Black women, Black mothers became a symbol of criminality. And by the end of the, by the, end of, the uh, of the century, you saw uh, much more of a focus on perceived youth gangs and youth violence in the city. Um, one of the more significant paradoxes we continue to struggle with is why Boston continues to have this sort of mythical status, both as a liberal bastion and as, as the, the very first professional police force, as if that meant that the department was exceptional, that it didn't have uh, any, any kind of racist history when it, when it actually does. And we hope that this work uh, really helps to dispel, continue to dispel that myth. Um, we really wanted to thank the organizers of the Conversations on Race and Policing for having us here. All of the support we've received at UMass Boston from the Sociology Department and the Gaston Institute, uh, as well as our supporters uh, internationally. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, even after these, this talk, please feel free to reach out. Both of us would be very happy to 
to engage with you. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you all so much for, for sharing so much information. Um, at this time, there aren't any Q&A questions that have popped up yet. Um, again, feel free to add your questions so that our speakers can respond. Um, but I do have a couple of things that I would like to, to share. Again, just a deep appreciation for how in-depth you all went with this discussion. Um, there was one case in particular that I tell my students about. Um, it was an operation within the local police department in San Francisco called Operation Zebra. They were looking for the zebra killers. And in that case, they had detained uh, 600 black men that fit a general profile that the department was given. And so that reminds me heavily of Willie Bennett's case as well, right? This over-policing of black and brown bodies. Um, another interesting connection that I made was also the Moynihan report that was released within the 70s, right? Yeah. Where it talks about essentially Black people must find a way to overcome the tragedies and prejudice that they've experienced, right? It's almost as if, and please correct me or, or speak in uh, on this as well, Daniel, but um, most of the historic racism that we've experienced uh, is not necessarily systemic, right? It's sometimes things that we have allowed to happen within the community that we need to almost um, situate our bootstraps and rise above from. Um, have you looked at that in your research as well? I'm, I have a, a student group now uh, that's doing work trying to link the Moynihan Rapport with other um, other ways of sort of framing um, uh, the black mother black motherhood at the time, and and are also trying to link it up with how the larger welfare movement unfolded. So um, I think you're right on. I think there's some there, there's some students who are really trying to bring out those threads right now. Yeah, Amber, if I may, um, I I um, remember the the Moynihan report, and for me, because uh, I was doing research on black women. For me, the bottom line was um, black mothers were blamed for the actions of their children, as as uh, Daniel um, just sort of um, implied, and uh, and so it it wasn't um, and and of course his his uh, solution was make them get married. You know they they need to get married, and you don't realize that two poor people are not going to make a difference in, in a family, you know, especially with high unemployment rates of uh, African-American men. Uh, so it was, it, it was really quite uh, disruptive in terms of the academic world. Um, uh, I th and I think it came out in maybe 65 or so, uh, but it was it was an absolute and and Moynihan was a was a senator, but he was a former sociologist who worked mm -hmm. for the I think State Department, and it was just it was just horrible. It was just blatantly blatantly racist. It was not the system that was the problem. It was these black women raising these crazy black kids uh, that were the problem. So I think my mm -hmm. question for Daniel might be. So we, can we put to rest the idea of the um, the rotten apple? I mean, I think so. I, in some of my in some of the work that I've done uh, apart from this, what we talk about is less the rotten apple, but more about the rotten tree. Yes, about how yeah. you you know just just by getting rid of one or two or three problematic officers doesn't necessarily change how the leadership, how the rules are built, how compensation how officers are compensated. How, uh, there are these entire structures within the department that don't change by just removing one or two or three bad officers, that you still have uh, a significant amount of misconduct that's built into the daily organ the, the daily processes that the organization is involved in. Oh, I think you might one one more question, I think. Um... I'm just I'm being kind by saying one more question, but I probably have about 20 more. And I see Michael's Michael's hand is raised. So why don't you go, Michael, and I'll come back. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, so one of the questions I have is, is how much access have you had to Michael Cox? Both, you know, I, I mean, he's such an interesting 
case study because of the sort of his his good intentions in joining the police department, the actual reality that he found and, and the beating that he suffered, uh, and then going through litigation against the department that he continues to work for. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it seems that, it, it, you know, not not to mention coming back to lead that organization, uh, that uh, it, that his insights would be critically important. Uh, but it seems to me that he's been somewhat reticent to talk about a lot of that out, outside of what, what was covered in the press. And there's an excellent book for the audience called The Fence by Dick Blair. Oh, yeah. You yes. know, but uh, uh, I, um, I don't I haven't spoken much with him privately. I have seen him speak publicly and I have heard him reflect on uh, the, the incident. Uh, mm. and, and really everything that happened afterward with the department, their inability, you know, his inability to get any kind of traction at the, at the initial investigation. Um, and mostly he just, like you say, really wants to put him, put it behind him. You know, he, he talks about these uncomfortable moments he had in the department while the suit was unfolding itself. Um, and, and all of the ugliness even before that, because I, I didn't mention all of the things that happened when he actually suit, when he, when internal investigators were subpoena were sending out subpoenas to a lot of the officers who were there on the scene it was at that point that he started to get death threats uh intimidating phone calls officers showed up to his home um his tires were slashed and it was really only after all of that happened that he decided to uh to sue the the city and the department um but i think in terms of how he sees that moment in history and how he sees his job as an officer now, I mean, it it doesn't. He it's like he doesn't see that moment. It's like he's it, it's like he wraps up that moment as a blip in time, and it was an ugly scene, but it doesn't represent either his his view on the city as a person or his ability to police the the, the city and how how he would go about it as a as a leader. Um, he still very much sounds like a company man. If you if you talk to him, um, it, it's it's strange. It's I, I don't I don't know that I could necessarily have that kind of emotional attachment to an organization that I would feel like turned its back on me, and 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 was you know assaulted towards me. But you know he does. He's he's obviously built different than I am. So um, but that's that's the kind of en engagement I have with him, just mostly publicly. I haven't had an opportunity to have him sit and reflect. I would love that. Um, but but that's the, that's not the kind of interview that he uh, sits for very often. I think just oh, to follow you're up, you're muted. You're muted, Michael. Oh, sorry. If I, if, I'm sorry, Mary. Let me just follow up with this because it, uh, what happened to Michael Cox is actually pretty uh, far too regular occurrence in in police departments when uh, uh, black officers are undercover in plain clothes they're mistaken for suspects. I worked in Providence, Rhode Island as an FBI agent, and there was a black officer killed responding to a crime in, in, in plain clothes, killed by other officers. Um, and recently in St. Louis during the Black Lives Matter protests, an undercover, a black undercover agent within the protests w was caught in a kettle and severely beaten by police officers, mistaking him for a protester, of course, they shouldn't have be, been beating the protesters either, right. uh, but but it becomes very difficult to get any kind of accountability for that kind of action. And have, is is this is your research looking at that problem, or is that problem continuing in Boston, particularly, or or other cities that you've? I I I'm not really looking at that systematically around the country. I think that that's something that ought to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I the. I think the longer term, the longer vision that we've had for this project is to kind of look at Boston um, from this time going forward, but from the perspective of different communities. So we want to we want to look at uh, uh, and the next stage of the research would kind of turn to the Latino perspective. Um, down the road, we also want to look at the, um, the transgender perspective and the gay perspective in the city, because I mean, uh, that's not that's also not something that's been done from a criminological viewpoint. And there is a story to tell here from all the archival work that we've already been doing. I think this this question of um, black or brown chiefs of police or sheriffs 
is intriguing. And I, I agree with you that um, that there seems to be a disconnect once they get to the top. But organizational theory and sociology tells us that they have to be that way in order to get at the top or right. they don't get to the top. Right. And uh, and and we, I saw this uh, in L.A. with uh, Lee Baca, who is mm -hmm. now I think he's out of prison now, but he he was in prison. Uh, and and the second Latino uh, sheriff um, was Luna. And uh, and he just turned into a mad dog once he became the sheriff. And he he kind of ran on a, a liberal kind of platform and he is he's now trying to get back on because he was voted out um so i i would just argue that that you're never going to get an interview from a head of a department who is um who is who is the head of the department you're not going to get an interview to get the real answers because they become politicians and not not just uh cops uh, and it's been shown over and over and over again. So I hope in your research that you will um, maybe explore explore that because I think it's it's such an important point. And we we've had I think we've had one uh, former head of a police department, Norm Stamper, who was um, and he's written several books, but he was the the uh, chief. I think in Seattle, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, and he's just done a complete 180. But he they got him out of there because he did not he did, he had very liberal views and they didn't like it, you know. So you're you're not guaranteed that you're going to stay there. So um, just my two cents in terms of the the leadership of of these departments. No, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. If no other questions, I have another one. <laughs> or, or if I just ask you to to maybe uh, expound on um, the Charles Stewart case, because I, I I watched a documentary several months ago. The the newest, I, I think it was Frontline or maybe uh, some somewhere on PBS, maybe HBO. I'm not sure, uh, yeah. but it was over several nights, I believe. And yeah. uh, and what was done to the community was. I mean, they did such a great job of, because there are people who are alive today who were traumatized by that. Oh, yeah. So could, could you explain that a little bit more to our audience? Um, I mean, that was what, uh, that was October of 89. Um, and I, I actually live and run right near where that uh, all went down. Brigham and Young, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital is Women's probably Hospital. one of the most renowned in the area. Mm -hmm. um, that's where... Carol Stewart was leaving. She was pregnant at the time. They had they they were just having an appointment there, um, and that's when Charles Stewart says that uh, he that someone jumped into the car at, when they were at a stoplight and drove them to a secluded area, shot him and and um, Carol, you know, in, in killing her but only injuring him, which that to anyone who was paying attention set off alarm bells from the very beginning because why would you shoot and kill you know. A, a, a woman who and, and when you have like a six foot fo former football player who is in a more immediate threat right if you're if you're a full-grown man so um there was there was just a lot of complications with the investigations initially uh with it, and um there were and i think within a, a few hours or actually within the within maybe within a few days uh the mayor went on tv publicly and really just asked the police to be as aggressive as possible so the encouragement from um, really came from the highest levels uh, of power in the city. And uh, it, it was at that point that the department didn't necessarily write a policy of stop and frisk, but they kind of told their officers, particularly one unit, the anti uh, the citywide anti-crime unit, to do what they had to do um, and, and to find and suss out the suspect. And they went systematically into that housing project, going from home to home. And, and in fact, Willie, when, when they found Willie Bennett's home, because he wasn't the only person arrested and, and accused of the crime, there was a number of others, including a former homeless man, Alan Swanson. But Willie Bennett got uh, the brunt of it because they ran, completely ransacked his home. Um, that part is very well covered in that documentary. I mean, you see his mother kind of, you know, with the whole house torn apart right behind her. 
and she doesn't even know what's what's going on. They don't. Uh, um, and part of the part of the challenge also was that uh, Willie Bennett had a very checkered past, right? This was someone who had imbo been involved in armed robberies before. Uh, he had several drug offenses on his record. He was well known to uh, the officers of that citywide anti crime unit. So to to them, it kind of seemed like it was a slam dunk. Um, but but it also belies the fact that there was a lot of coercion involved on the part of the police uh, to get uh, evidence against Willie Bennett in, initially, because it was his nephew and another neighborhood boy whose testimony was used to, to uh, ultimately try and convict him. While he was going throughout the trial, um, it was revealed that the husband had killed Carol Stewart because he committed suicide, and then the brother admitted that he helped to uh, conceal evidence in the case, including all of her money and purse and wallet, which which the husband said had been stolen, but, you know, had been given to the brother, including uh, the murder weapon. So, um, but the, after all of this broke, the community really, really uh, lost a lot of trust in the department. And that, and it was really in that time that the, um, you know, the, the, the collection of Black clergymen kind of came together to um, try and Make sense, uh, you know. Make sense of what was happening in that situation at that time. Yes, Michael. Um, it, it, a question I have. It, it, you know, one of the things that I've been looking at, typically, that as you mentioned, the high rates of violent crime in black and brown communities justify these aggressive police actions, or are used to justify the police actions. But typically, when you look at police clearance rates, they're not solving the, the violent crimes that they're sent in to solve that, that supposedly justify these tactics. And yet there, there seems to be a disconnect between whether the tact or, or a lack of evaluation of whether the tactics are actually effective in addressing the problem that they claim justifies them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're going to be um, winding up a little bit. If you if you had a comment about that, um, Daniel, because I wanted to ask you and LG a, 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 a mutual question. Go ahead, sure. please. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. The other the other wrinkle there is is um, the the community's lack of trust is also a reason why officers feel like they have to rely on that kind of tactic. Right at that time, the department. Um, was not really did not really have a clear strategy on how to address the crime problem there uh, the department in fact was denying that they had a gang problem or a drug problem at all they were much more focused on whitey bulger and italian style mob crime and irish style mob crime you know that black and latino urban violence like we know it now um, was not really on their radar right they they were kind of at the time arguing that that was more of a new york and la thing um but but you know so the communities the community's lack of uh, uh, trust for the department was one of the reasons that, that that was encouraged. But then it was also you know the blowback that you received after even more aggressive tactics like that. So I, I um, LG I'm going to assume is closer to our students' age than than you are. <laughs> so. I, I was just wondering, I mean, occasionally we'll ask our guests how they got from point A to point B. Wh how did you get interested in this topic? How did you get interested in your um, your area of study in school? Do you want to start, LG? Um, sure, yeah. Um, I actually, I, I went to school initially for writing. Um, and I chose to study the social sciences, um, because I think that, um, creative practices necessitate an understanding of people and society. And I, I kind of accidentally just fell in love with sociology. Uh, I think I, I've always sort of thought that way. So it was a very easy fit. Um, and when I took, um, intro to criminal justice with Professor Gascon, um, is when I got more into the criminology, criminal justice 
side of sociology and um um So yeah, he presented I, I, opportunities for you to to help him with his research and yes 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 the rest, well, the rest is history. <laughs> well, we're glad you did. We're glad you made that decision. Uh, I especially because I'm a sociologist and I know Daniel is a sociologist too. So good choice, good choice. <laughs> Daniel, um, I mean, I I wanted to become a police officer uh, when I was studying at Cal, at Cal State. You know, that was my whole motivation. You know, many people come out of that program um, in, in criminal justice, wanting to become professor, professionals in the criminal justice system of one type or another. Um, but it was really in the process of working with faculty there that I kind of found research and, and fell in love with it. Um, I, I was like working with, with faculty in the summer and uh, learning how to, you know, fix uh, data in Excel and, and do minor statistical uh, analyses. And, uh, and that was really it. You know, I, I, I found out that professors have much, you know, what I thought was like the summer's off completely. Um, and I thought, wow, what a cool job. And I, I don't know, I got along with the, the faculty there. You know, I still, many of the, of the people who were really influential to me, Tibbetts, Omega, um, uh, Gisela Bickler, uh, Seacrest, who's no longer with us, um, but and Brian Levin, like those, I was just cool with them on a personal level, and they felt, and I, and I felt like I could do research along with them. Um, right. I think I kind of brought that a similar sensibility to the research that we are doing now. I think um, I wanted to, because I I started to learn more and more about the city of Boston. I wanted to kind of re replicate the LA study that we did, and. I also wanted to work more closely with students in a mentorship capacity. And um, I just, I was offered some research funding and no one told me to do under uh, undergraduate focus research, um, but that that was my goal. You know, I was teaching two, two, uh, two sections of intro to, to criminal justice and they gave me this opportunity to with these funds. And I was like, hey, let me just talk to the students who I get along with really, really well in the class. And LG was one of them. Uh, I had another student at the time, um, uh, JB Baez, uh, who uh, we also hired. And, and then uh, from, from another introductory course, I hired uh, Melanie Matoja. So all of my students were from, you know, initial undergrad courses who were just very bright, very interested students and who appreciated my critical perspective. And, and that was it. We were just all kind of vibing on the same wavelength. And that's that's how <laughs> that's how we made all these connections. Yeah. Well, it's a good lesson for our students too. You know, you have you can't be shy. You got to go to office hours, and you have to ask. You know, can I help you with your research, or can you help me with my research, whatever? But I mean, that's I, I always used to say. You know, so and so begat so and so, who begat so and so. You know, we, there's yeah. this, there's this there's this direct line between let's say um, let's say Edna Bonasich and what's going on at Harvard now you know because she was she was just such a wonderful uh, sociologist and researcher so uh, unless there are other questions panel folks what do you all think uh, I'll ask one more how how much access to the Boston Police Department do you have have they been very transparent in sharing <laughs> data no, no. Um, I, I don't think they have to them. think at all. Uh, no, LG has tried to get a hold of them. They make but, it very difficult to get any um, any kind of archival data. But so, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, there. Um, I've I've tried to to contact them to get um, to their archives, and I've found that they don't. First of all, they most of the people there don't know about. Um, how the records are stored. Uh, they recently have outsourced some of their record storage to a private company. Um, and they're also not a very open organization. I remember one of the first times I tried to call, someone yelled at me and hung up. <laughs> so yeah, it's not been, it's not been easy. Uh, and uh, I know that Jim Lair, who wrote the fence, um, had he had to FOIA almost everything. We haven't gotten to that stage, but we're getting there. We're getting there pretty soon. We we wanted to 
gather archival data. We, we still have a, a mind, half a mind to do some interviews, and then we want to go back to the department. Looks like we have a kind of fun question. Do you want to read it, Amber? Yeah, I was gonna. I was just about to say that um, we have a Q and A question. Um, Anonymous is asking, "Have you seen the series The Wire?" <laughs> yes, I recently started watching this show uh, with my wife. Um, after 20 years of saying, no, I'm not, I'm not going to watch it because I really hate procedural shows. I feel like they always get the facts wrong. Um, and but it, but it's 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 proving to be a, a very well put together show. And I really yes. enjoy it. Yes, there's I a agree. lot um, that that show. I, we actually started watching that show because someone suggested watching uh, We Own This City, which was um, another very recent police corruption case out of Baltimore. And uh, both of those shows uh, put together, I, I mean, that that city has a much starker problem, I think, and their their city, that their history needs to be teased out in a similar way. Um, but yes, I've, I've been watching that show and thoroughly enjoying it, I must say. <laughs> How about you, LG? Um, I have not watched The Wire. <gasps> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, 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 well, I like Daniel, I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I know. But if you get a chance, if you get a chance, please check it out. Are we going out now, Amber? Yeah, that's that's about it for uh, the Q and A questions. Uh, does anyone else have a question to ask or comment to make? Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Again, this was so informative. Um, I'll be sending this link to my students to review. Once we're done, um, yeah, I, I really thoroughly appreciated every aspect of the conversation. Thanks so much for the invitation. Be well, and thanks for thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Take care. Bye bye. Everyone.